Tonight, almost back to normal. Nightclubs, concerts and theatres to reopen and social distancing lifted as Scotland turns the corner in the Omicron wave. I can confirm today that all of these measures will be lifted from next Monday, 24th January. As COVID cases and hospitalisations continue to fall, the push to get hundreds of thousands of people who have yet to get vaccinated to come forward. And could Doug the Spud be the biggest potato in the world? Scottish scientists may be the ones to decide. I'm Kellyanne Woodland in Edinburgh. And I'm John Mackay in Glasgow. This is the STV News at six. Good evening. Nightclubs reopening, a return of large indoor events like concerts and theatre and social distancing lifted. From next Monday, Scotland will see the majority of COVID-19 restrictions eased after a significant fall in cases. The First Minister told MSPs Scotland had turned the corner on the Omicron wave. Indoor contact sports will also be able to restart and there will be no extension to the vaccine passport scheme. Here's our political correspondent, Ewan Petrie. It's been a difficult start to the year for venues like this, forced to adapt to a new raft of restrictions. But from next week, one metre distancing, as well as the three household limits and table service, will be scrapped. It's not what I was thinking was going to happen today. I thought this was going to be extended into maybe February, but it's certainly going to benefit us because we'll be able to go back to normal and not cancel their gigs that are coming up. So it'll help us, but I don't know if it we've been hurt too much already by it. Nightclubs will also be able to reopen and the removal of limits for indoor events means the stage is set for the return of theatre. We've now got a whole job to do um, about building back confidence. We know we've got some great shows. We know we've got a lot of shows that are very booked up, but we also know some people will be a bit cautious, so we want to work with those uh, people. So it's just that um, building back for indoor sports clubs, the absence of fans has hit hard. If it had gone much longer, it was, it was starting to look really difficult without further support. Um, but we, um, you know, we're delighted that people are coming back in the building. The fans are the sport. Um, the sport, you know, it, it, it needs bums on seats. It needs people buying tickets. You know, buying food and beverage. So um, it, it's been it's been very important the news for us. The First Minister says the data shows Omicron peaked in the first week of January, and we're now on the downward slope of this wave of cases. Notwithstanding the improving situation, the level of COVID infection circulating in the community is still high. So to minimise the risk of getting the virus, it would be sensible for all of us to remain cautious in our social interactions at this stage. Even though from Monday we will no longer recommend a fixed upper limit on numbers of households, if we all continue to keep gatherings as small as our circumstances allow for now, I would suggest until the end of this month, we will reduce our chances of getting infected. Some basic mitigations remain in place, including face coverings and guidance to work from home for now. The government decided against changes to the vaccine passport scheme. The First Minister has twice threatened to extend the scheme to Scottish businesses. Twice she's backed down. Isn't it about time the First Minister accepted that this scheme is a dud and scrapped it altogether? This is a significant step towards normality. However, it comes with a warning. The health service remains under significant pressure. Ewan Petrie, STV News. Well, our political editor, Col Mackay, was watching the statements and Colin, the First Minister, went further than expected today. Well, the First Minister has been cautious throughout COVID for almost the last two years on this. So clearing all the Omicron restrictions in one go on Monday goes further and faster than certainly I had expected. She says it now looks like the, the, the Omicron peaked in the first week of January, but it's still having a massive impact on the NHS in Scotland. Scotland recorded its worst ever accident and emergency waiting times in the week up to the 9th of January. Almost a third of patients waited more than the four-hour target time to be dealt with. Now, that four-hour target, they're trying to get 95% of them done in that, in that timescale. 
In actual fact, they got 67.4. And some of Scotland's biggest hospitals had the worst waiting times. Glasgow's Queen Elizabeth had 46.8% treated in that, or dealt with in that four hour target time. Edinburgh Royal, 50.8%. Now the Health Secretary says that he's sorry to patients who had to wait longer, but he says part of the problem was COVID related staff absences in the NHS. And when I look at general occupancy for COVID, an over 160% increase from the two weeks prior. So yes, staff absences, COVID occupancy, but also the accumulative effect of the pandemic all played a part and made this week, or that week, I should say, the most challenging week the NHS has ever faced. The government simply have not got a grip of the situation. This has been going on since October, and yet the staff are not supported, they're not helped, and patients are the ones who suffer the most because they're left waiting, and that is a risk to their health and well-being. During that first week in January, there were more than 7,000 NHS staff absences, many of them self-isolating because of COVID. Now, the First Minister says that we're on the, the downward slope of the, the Omicron curve. She says things should start improving, but it will take weeks, if not even longer, for that to come through in the hospitals. All right, Colin, from the Scottish Parliament, thank you. Well, the First Minister said booster vaccines had helped drive Omicron cases down, but it's estimated more than 600,000 people over the age of 18 who are eligible for a booster still haven't had the jag. There are also hundreds of thousands who have not yet taken up the offer of a first or second dose of the COVID vaccine. To reach vulnerable groups, including those experiencing homelessness, teams of nurses are bringing vaccination clinics to them, setting up drop-in clinics and support services and temporary accommodation. Our chief reporter Sharon Frew has been finding out more. After two and a half years in and out of hostels, Christine now has a place to call home. Last year, she received her first COVID jag when nurses visited the temporary accommodation she was living in. She learned through social media about this drop-in clinic. I was going through hostels there for a while, do you know what I mean? So I never really had an address, but that's my house now and all that, and I've turned my life around. But it was just quite hard for me to get my second one, so I've been kind of just trying to get it done as fast as, just to keep myself safe. The Lodging House Mission in Glasgow opens its doors to those experiencing homelessness, mental health issues or addiction and others in need of hot food and advice. As volunteers handled the busy lunch service, upstairs in an area normally used by street soccer, two nurses were giving out COVID and flu vaccinations. Your flu jag as well or just your COVID? If you have a chaotic life, making an appointment can be very, very difficult and it can also be very stressful. When you take that stress away and it's here, people can access as, as they need it. Well, that makes perfect sense to me. This is a, a population that can be quite transient and moving a, around a fair bit. So we knew that when we started, we were going to have to do really schedule after schedule. So this is a, a, a booster kind of session this time, but also we're picking up people who are now having their first dose and then second dose. And so it's just going to be a continuous programme. It was the simple chalkboard on the pavement that brought others inside. Uh, I'm a bit nervous, I'm not doing it. This is my, my very first actual jab jab, aye, out of the hall. I got two doors along my neighbour died at uh, 44, just uh, three weeks ago. From Covid? Yeah. I took somebody up today who was very frightened about getting their injection. I'm a trusted person, I sat with them, but we've also had members of the public use the service as well. Well, I've, I've not got access to you online, so but when I heard this was open today, I thought, why not just come round the corner? Especially with a new variant going round, you know, it's, 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 you don't know, it's better to be safe than sorry, I suppose. Outreach teams are visiting 50 different locations across Glasgow. This is only the second drop-in clinic this charity has hosted. It now intends to operate as a weekly service. Sharon Frew, STV News. Boris Johnson has denied lying to Parliament after telling MPs he thought he was at a work event in May 2020 rather than a Downing Street drinks party. The Prime Minister apologised again this afternoon but insists that nobody told him beforehand that the event was against the Covid rules. 
He repeatedly refused to rule out resigning if an investigation into that party and others finds he has misled Parliament. Our correspondent Catherine Sampson is in the central lobby at Westminster. And Catherine, this is the first time we've heard from Boris Johnson since last week. That's right. Uh, we haven't heard from him since Prime Minister's questions here last Wednesday. And that is when he told MPs that that now infamous uh, party in the Garden of Downing Street in May 2020 was, in his view, a work event. Now, his former top adviser, Dominic Cummings, has a blog. And in that, he says that assertion is a lie. And he says he would swear under oath that he warned the Prime Minister not to have that event in the Garden of Downing Street because it would breach COVID rules. Here's the Prime Minister's response to that today. Nobody told me, I can absolutely, I'm absolutely categorical about this, nobody said to me this is an event that is against the rules, uh, that is in breach of uh, what we're asking everybody else to do, uh, should not go ahead. What I remember is going out into that garden for a, a short time and uh, for 25 minutes or so, thanking staff who'd worked on COVID, who were continuing to work on COVID, and then going back to my, to my office. Well, today, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, broke his silence. Now, he says he believes the Prime Minister's explanation, but in an interview, when he was asked if he gave Boris Johnson his full backing, he abruptly ended it. Now, we know the Scottish Secretary, Alistair Jack, says he's behind Boris Johnson 100%. We know the Scottish Conservatives leader, Douglas Ross, thinks Boris Johnson should resign. The other Scottish Tory MPs, well, they still seem to be making up their minds. Earlier, I spoke to Andrew Bowie, the Tory MP for West Aberdeenshire. Do you believe the Prime Minister has lied to Parliament? Look, uh, I would like to see what Sue Gray reports. Then I will make up my mind as to where we where we go. I need to see the facts. It's very important that we see all okay. the facts later. Would you know if you were at a party or a work event? Uh, yes, I would know if I was at a party or a work event. Do you think event. the Prime Minister would know if he was at a party or a work Prime event? Prime Minister said what he has said. I fully... Uh, uh, accept his version of events as they stand right now but as I said I would like to see the, 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 the full details as Sue Gray will publish in her report and I don't think the apology that the Prime Minister offered the House was good enough. So the Prime Minister continues to try and survive this scandal. The question I suppose now is can he fully recover from it? Another bruising session of Prime Minister's questions expected here tomorrow. Catherine at Westminster, thank you. All right, let's have a look at other stories across Scotland now. And an Edinburgh nursery has been fined £800,000 after an 11-month-old baby choked to death on a piece of food. An investigation found Bright Horizons Nursery failed to ensure staff were supervising mealtimes adequately when the boy died in 2019. Its chief executive offered their heartfelt apologies and said lessons had been learned from the tragedy. Around 300 jobs are at risk after a Clyde Bank-based energy firm became the latest supplier to collapse. Together Energy has 176,000 customers across the UK. The company blamed the sustained increase in wholesale energy prices for its demise. And Conservative peer Michelle Moan is being investigated by the House of Lords Standards Watchdog over the awarding of government PPE contracts worth more than £200 million. It follows a complaint that the entrepreneur broke code of conduct rules by not declaring an interest in PPE Metro and lobbying for the company early in the pandemic. Lawyers for Lady Moan say she is not connected to the company in any capacity. Almost 400 accusations of sexual misconduct have been made to Scottish universities in the past five years, according to new figures. Rape Crisis Scotland has warned the numbers are the tip of the iceberg. The highest number were made at the University of Edinburgh, where 76 reports were filed, followed by 68 at St Andrews and 60 at Glasgow University. Vanessa Kennedy reports. These figures show that out of almost 400 accusations of sexual violence across 18 higher education institutions, the highest number were here at Edinburgh University. Now, most of the reports were made against students. Investigations were launched into more than 250 of these accusations, which resulted in 130 sanctions being handed out. But not all universities have confirmed the number of those investigations and punishment. Well, today, I 
I spoke to students here in Edinburgh about how safe they feel. It's a huge problem and we know like people who have been like assaulted and the uni has done nothing and I've read like multiple testimonies and the uni doesn't like deal with things properly. Quite worrying, especially like you want to feel like you're safe on campus and like safe with the rest of the student community. There needs to be more university things implemented in place. Chat lines, help. A lot of times it gets reported and that's the last you hear of it. Well, campaigners say that these numbers are concerning and something that shouldn't be accepted. They can range from inappropriate touching right through to serious sexual assault and while the figures are high and are really worrying, really I think they're the tip of the iceberg because so many people just do not feel able to report what's happened to them, either to the university authorities or to the police. Well, a spokesperson for Edinburgh University responded to these figures by saying the university does not tolerate sexual violence nor any form of abuse within its community and takes reports like these very seriously. They said it continues to work at preventing and responding to such forms of abuse and have established a sexual violence and harassment liaison team to provide support for survivors. Vanessa Kennedy, STV News, Edinburgh. A shopping centre in Glasgow's south side is in line for a makeover. Developers have come up with plans to transform Shawland's shopping arcade and consultation is underway. Plans are at an early stage, but they will see the 1960s building pulled down and replaced by new shops and flats. Sasha Spratt reports. The bustling heart of Glasgow's south side, Shawland's arcade, once the destination for the area's shoppers. With the centre now over 50 years old, plans are afoot for a total revamp. It's, it's, it's held up well over the years, isn't it, really? They should improve a wee bit and encourage, encourage proper businesses to come into it, I think, you know. It certainly doesn't look that nice. It could do with a bit of, like, refreshing, like, the, the metal and stuff that's all rusted. It's the exact same from when we were young and we'd come with Gran and we'd always buy, you know, those, like, felt colouring and things from oh, the pound yeah. shop. There's a lot of nice shops here in Shawlands. They're going to make it up market. The way it used to be, Sean's. I hope it'll mean more new shops coming in. Plans will see the old building completely demolished, making way for new shops, 300 flats and public garden and terrace spaces. We have consulted the local community. We started that last uh, summer and certainly the feedback was um, people would like to see a mixture of both high streets, traders and local independents. So the idea is that this raised walkway goes, the new shop units are down at the Kilmarnock Road level and that actually allows us to really double the width of the pavement. Over the road, businesses are looking forward to the potential changes. There's mixed views in the community, some are for, some are against it. Some are maybe upset at the lack of parking. Now the bubble has burst at the West End and it's slowly coming back to the south side. And Shawlands, uh, once this arcade is gone and the new development, it will be a prime site. Shopping habits have changed and it's time it has, it has to go. Developers have already taken views of people in the area. A second consultation on updated plans opens next month. Sasha Spratt, STV News, Shawlands. To the weather, and Sean's had an easy time of it recently with the weather pretty much staying the same. Is it going to change? Let's find out. A cold snap is on the way. <laughs> Tui Blue Hotels. Sponsor STV Weather. Well, a big change in the weather coming in tomorrow. Look north at the blues there. That's what's heading our way tomorrow. Colder air. And as has been the case so far this season, any cold incursions last just a few days before the milder air returns from the Atlantic. That's going to be the case over the next couple of days. So for the time being, staying fairly mild, albeit still rather cloudy, shout out breaks of rain. But as we go through tonight, that rain will turn heavier from the northwest. Temperatures about 5, 6 degrees, staying quite windy across western parts as well. Now, this little band of rain is a cold front. It moves away southwards into tomorrow morning, and then we go into much brighter skies. So tomorrow, a much better day for sunshine, lots of it around. However, there will be showers across the highlands, feeding southwards across Argyle. A few of those coming into Stirlingshire and as far south as North Lanarkshire, perhaps around Renfrewshire, Nimver, Clyde. Now, those showers will be turning wintry on higher levels later on the day, and potentially to lower levels in the highlands. 
Netherlands. As that colder air starts to dig its way in, we start tomorrow with temperatures about 7 degrees, dropping down to 4 or 5 degrees by the end of the day. Thursday, a nice quiet day, albeit rather cloudy, but there will be some brighter spells. But look at the afternoon temperatures, 4, 5 degrees Celsius. But then... Just a brief cold spell. We see our temperatures rising 9, 10 degrees as we head into the weekend and we're back to cloud and light rain. Bye-bye. Tui Blue Hotels. Sponsor STV Weather. And finally, Scottish science has long been a world leader from the discovery of penicillin to the invention of television. But tonight it's facing what could be one of its most controversial tasks ever. Oh yes, agricultural DNA fingerprint experts at a lab in Edinburgh have been called in to determine if what's claimed to be the biggest potato in the world really is. Our senior reporter Gordon Cree has been getting to the root of the story. They've called it Doug the Potato because they dug it up. He's an ugly little critter. It's the sort of thing that only a mother could love. The discovery was made at a garden in New Zealand, weighing in at 7.9 kilos. The prospect of getting in the Guinness Book of Records is clearly an appealing one, if, of course, it is a potato. I gave him the old taste test and I said to my wife, no, nah, it's a potato. But that has to be independently verified, and that's where our experts come in. The team at Science and Advice for Scottish Agriculture, based in Ratho, have a database of more than 2,000 potato varieties and for a priority case can get a result within 24 hours of receiving a sample. There's a lot resting on the shoulders of the scientists here. They're going to have to chip away at the sample to find out if its DNA has anything in common with the humble Salanum tuberosum, as it's known in Latin. If it does, then New Zealand gets to fly the flag for a smashing success. If not, then its claims probably deserve to be roasted. They need to know, um, yeah, what genus it is, you know, what variety it is, you know, what its grandfather's name was. Just to add spice, the big potato record is currently held in Britain, so we may be helping serve up the title to the other side of the world. If it does turn out to be the real deal, it's enough to make eight bags of oven chips, 173 packets of crisps or 26 baked potatoes. The beans will cost you extra. That just goes to prove it doesn't matter how big your potato is, it's what you do with it that counts. Salt and vinegar or salt and sauce, depending on your local preference. Anyone? Gordon Cree, STV News, Edinburgh. It's a little disconcerting that, Kelly, and I have a confession to make. Of all the insults uh -huh. I've had online over the years, and there have been many, the one that really sticks was being called a potato face presenter. <laughs> That's probably because it's uh, close to the truth, John, eh? Glad I confided in you, Kelly, and thanks for that. <laughs> all of us, good night. Good night. <laughs>